Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Shane Claiborne is a best-selling author, speaker, and activist. He is a champion for grace, an advocate for the homeless, and an activist speaking out against war, gun violence, and the death penalty. Shane has worked alongside Mother Teresa, and he's a founding member of The Simple Way, an organization dedicated to building community in Philadelphia. To learn more about Shane, head to shaneclaiborne.com. Amid the ruins of abandoned cathedral where homeless families lived, Shane caught a fresh glimpse of what it means to be the church. With ancient stories of the early Christians and contemporary stories of ordinary radicals, Shane will invite us to reimagine what it means to be the body of Christ alive in the world. Here is Shane Claiborne. I should first say that I have lived in Philadelphia, which is a great city, the city of love, you know, Uh, it's what it means, city of brotherly or sisterly love. Uh, It's funny, though, I can remember one of my friends talking about uh, the first time he got mugged in Philadelphia, and uh, most of us have been mugged in Philadelphia, And, uh, and he said the first time was real interesting, though, the guy came up, took his wallet, and my buddy was, you know, sort of gonna take off and and run and uh and the guy said no 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 come back come back uh, I just want your money I'll, I'll give you your license and credit cards back I don't want to inconvenience you <laughs> and he said after all this is not New York City this is Philadelphia brother and um so we're pr- proud of our fine city but I I grew up in East Tennessee which is really really different from uh, Philly and uh, y- you know it's it's the deep south sort of the Bible belt and uh, I, that that formed my whole worldview of what it meant to be the church you know I mean we went to youth group and uh, in fact there wasn't a ton to do in East Tennessee so we went to like four different youth groups you know almost every night <laughs> and uh, I don't know if y'all have done the youth group thing but uh, it was just, it was an interesting place. Um, where they, it was sort of its own subculture, you know, where we had our, the, we sang goofy songs like, um, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, baby, let, yeah, you know, and so, and, and then, uh, if you didn't grow up in that subculture, don't worry, um, but uh, they would give us these charts, and it would say, um, if you like this secular band, then you'll really like this Christian band, you know, <laughs> if you remember those. And then you, like, like burnt all of our CDs, you know, because secular mu- music came from hell. And then, like, we, we started listening to the alternatives, and we're like, Ooh, this does not sound like Metallica. You know, I, I've been, I've been hoodwinked. You know, and and uh, sort of began to go, what, what is it? We have a really strange thing going, don't we? I mean, and so much of what we did in the church. I mean, I can remember some of the things that you start to wonder what it has to do with Jesus. Um, like one congregation had a lot of money, so they had a Velcro wall, you know, and that was one of these blow up inflatable walls, and you'd wear this sticky suit and run and jump and stick to the wall for Jesus, you know. <laughs> but you start you sort of start to go, What what are we doing? You know, and, and I, I did something really dangerous, which is I started reading my Bible and um and going, My gosh, what if Jesus meant this stuff? You know, I, like, does anyone really believe it? And and I think what's so exciting is there's a whole movement in the church right now of folks that are starting to do that, you know? But the interesting thing is sometimes we find that the words of Jesus put it, uh, uh, us at odds with uh, some of the things that have come to characterize what it means to be church. 
And that's what I, I want us to think about right now. And, you know, I mean, it's even interesting just coming out of the season of Advent and Christmas to see how easy it is to forget the message and to forget the very story from which we come that we celebrate at Christmas, isn't it? Uh, I can remember one pastor, he said, yeah, you know, I mean, here we were in, uh, uh, on just approaching the big Sunday service, and uh, he said, I came in the night before the Christmas service, and I looked at our sanctuary, and I just thought, this looks no different from the shopping mall, you know, like, what, what are we doing, and here we are celebrating the birth of the refugee son of God, and we're spending 70% of our retail, you know, <laughs> purchases during the season of Advent and Christmas. And so he said, this is, this is, we got to do something different. And so he said, enough, you know, and that night he went out to a farm and uh, he was prayerfully thinking about how to, how to honor Jesus at Christmas. And so he got a bunch of manure from the farm and brought it back with him, uh, you know, a truck full, and just started spreading it out all over the sanctuary, you know, just throwing turd everywhere. And uh, and then, you know, the next morning, everybody comes in, you know, they're coming in for the Christmas service, and they got their best clothes on, you know, and they're kind of s- smelling a little, you know, and they, like, sit down next to their neighbor and sort of look suspiciously and, you know, awkwardly and and then this pastor preached and he said and oh the spirit was with us that day he said I preached about how we have a God that enters into the crap you know the stench the mess of this world a God who was born in in, in the form of Jesus in the middle of a genocide where little boys were getting killed all over the land and he's born where there was no place in the end and he's born into the stench And that story is a story of the Jesus that we're trying to follow, the Jesus who wandered the world with no place to lay his head and died the scandalous and horrific death of a criminal on a cross. And so that's the story we come from. But it's so uh, easy to lose, I think. And and I I ended up, um, as Karl Barth said, you know, reading the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other and going, have we really begun to be Christian? You know, have we really begun to to live into what it means to be the church? And so I wanted to study that. So I studied sociology and I studied the Bible up at uh, Eastern University in Philadelphia. And I had great teachers like Tony Campolo and so many others, but I, where the Bible really came to life for me was when uh, I left the halls of academia, you know, and I went into the streets. And I, I got to tell you, to this day, I've learned more about Jesus through the tears of homeless women than any systematic theology book ever taught me. It's not to say don't read your systematic theology, <laughs> you know, but it's to say that's where my faith was ignited. And I can remember in 1995, uh, we were in the suburbs at our, our college, and we heard about the story of homeless families in Philadelphia. And the 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 front lines of the newspaper st- told the story of how there were dozens of homeless families, mostly mothers with children, that uh, were approaching the winter and in a really courageous move, they looked at all of the abandoned buildings that we have in North Philadelphia. And they, I mean, we've got 700 abandoned warehouses. We've got 20,000 abandoned houses. Um, it's just a wasteland. And in the middle of that, uh, there are thousands and thousands of families waiting for housing. And so they said, this is crazy. And they found this old abandoned Catholic church building, and they uh, moved into the cathedral. And they began to live there, uh, and that's what we read about in the newspaper. And the headline said, Church Resurrected. I love that, you know, and it told the story of how these these families were actually bringing this old building back to life. But then uh, the the terrible end of the story was that the Catholic Church, the archdiocese that owned the building, had given them an eviction notice, and they had 48 hours to get out. If they didn't get out, then they could be arrested for trespassing on church property. I don't know about you, but that didn't feel right. 
to us, you know. And we uh, uh, got a group of students together, and we said, let's find this place. So we went down, uh, and we found that cathedral. And on the front of the cathedral, the families had hung a banner uh, that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? powerful, right? And, and it was in there that I really uh, began to, to, to see uh, poverty, but I also began to see Jesus with new eyes, you know, and, and to think about what it really means to be the church. And uh, the families were fantastic. They, the, the media uh, made it look like the church was kicking homeless people out. And that's because the church was kicking homeless people out, you know. Uh, and, and so they came out, though, and the family said, well, we've been praying. We've been talking to God. We think God wants us to have housing, you know. And we asked God if we could stay in the church. And God said, this is his building, and we're welcome there. <laughs> and so they continued to live there. And that struggle for housing lasted not for 48 hours, but for months and months. And many of uh, those families got housing. We ended up moving into the neighborhood, and we started the little community where I've been at for the last uh, 10 or so years. But what happened in that cathedral was incredible I mean, because we, it, it, I think, exposed in just an, a, a, an unmistakable way the, the deep contradictions that we have within the body of Christ, you know. Uh, in fact, I can remember one week where uh, we got this box from a suburban congregation, and on it it said, For the Homeless. And we're, we're excited. You know, we open it up, and the box was filled with microwave popcorn. Sort of weird, because we, like, barely had electricity, much less a microwave, and popcorn wasn't at the top of our needs list, you know? Um, and and uh, as I saw that, I just thought, my gosh, how far we've come from... Uh, from from the the re lived reality of one another and and then uh, that same week we had another group of visitors actually came to the cathedral and they gave thousands of dollars to the family they gave a a bike to each kid and a turkey because it was almost uh, uh, the Thanksgiving and so they they gave all this and and then uh, the news media came and they 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 said this is the mob uh, so it was the Philadelphia mafia you know and we're like wow how about that you know. I guess God can use the mafia, but we'd love God to use the church. <laughs> you know? And it stirred all of these questions in us. We're like, my gosh. And we started reading in that cathedral. We started reading about the early church in the book of Acts, where it says all of the believers were together and they shared everything they had and no one claimed any of their possessions were their own. And it says, and there were no needy persons among them. They ended poverty. It was one of the signs of the birthday of the church because they figured out and they wrestled with the, this reality that we are born again, right? That we are brothers and sisters. And, and, and as we see that in the scripture, it, 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 it's this beautiful vision of folks that all of the offerings were put at the apostles' feet and then they raised up needs of one another and they started taking care of each other. And we, we saw these families starting to do that. And there was really a moment where we... Uh, um, I mean, we, we would have worship services, and we uh, would have communion, and it was sort of like stale bagels or old apple cider or whatever we could have. But it felt like the body of Christ, you know, for, for the, maybe the first time in many of our lives that we, we uh, some of us had a lot of scars from the church, and um, some, some of my colleagues had grown up Catholic, and they... Um, didn't always have great stories about that, you know, and some of them uh, sort of, they called themselves disenchanted Catholics, and others uh, uh, had grown up evangelical, and many of them had scars from that, and they called themselves recovering evangelicals, you know. <laughs> But there was a moment where together we said, we're going to stop complaining about the church that we've experienced and work on becoming the church that we dream of. As Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. We sort of said, we want to be the change we want to see in the church. You know, And the, the best critique of what's wrong is the practice of something better. The return to, to God's real dream for what this bride is meant to be. And... and uh, it's funny because as we started doing that, we saw that what we were really doing and what the Spirit was doing among us wasn't really anything new at all, you know? 
<laughs> but it seems like every few hundred years, the church sort of has an identity crisis where we get infected by the culture and the materialism and the militarism and all of that, and it gets into us, and we forget what it means to be Christian and what it means to be the church. And we started to read the stories of church history, of uh, renewals and movements, and I, th- I think we're in the middle of one now, you know, but we would see folks like St. Francis and Claire and Assisi, you know, that here they were in the middle of the, the materialism and the crusades of the 13th century in Italy, and they said, no, this is not the way the kingdom's going to come. And they heard this whisper from God that St. Francis talked so much about, and he said, I heard God whisper, repair my church, which is in ruins. And uh, the simpleton that he was, he literally started with bricks and mortar, you know, and, and started a building uh, of an a old abandoned cathedral that became a church of the outcasts and the lepers and, and the people who were so ostracized in their society. But it was it spread uh, this movement throughout the land that even the pope uh, told that he had had a vision from God that that the church was falling, but the corner was being held up by St. Francis and, and this 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 movement that was happening in the church. And so I, I think that it's exciting to, to see that what we're doing is, is nothing brand new, you know. And a lot of folks have identified uh, the current movement of, of what we see happening as a, a, a new form of monasticism. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer and so many others said that we can we, we continue to need uh, monastic movements in the church because these folks were in the middle of, 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 of all of the confusion in the church. They go to the desert, they go to the abandoned places, and they begin to rethink what it means to be Christian. And uh, I think many of you are in that space right now where we're thinking about that. And I want to spend some time uh, uh, on some of the the marks of what we see the Spirit doing in the church right now. A group of us a few years ago got together, and um, we, we had a gathering to, to talk about what are the distinctive marks that we see God uh, moving in, within intentional communities and Christians. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's a lot of language that gets thrown out there, like emerging church and emergent. And I, I'm not a huge fan of that because I don't see a lot of DNA or substance to it. You know, it's almost like anybody that's under 40 and has any fresh ideas, we just call them emergent. <laughs> You know, and then we can write them off. But I think like like what what I want to really talk about is the DNA and and the and the substance of of at least for many of us what we've come to see the, uh, that it means to be Christian in the 21st century for us. And the so I'll, I'll run through a few of these and then we'll we'll talk together. Okay, uh, the first is that that we are moving toward the abandoned places of the, the, the world, that we are moving towards those broken places. And, and everything in our culture teaches us to move away from suffering, but the Christian is moving uh, closer to suffering. It's, it's exactly the story of the incarnation, that Jesus, uh, God, Emmanuel, God with us, came into that suffering and came out of a town where nothing good could come from Nazareth, right? Uh, so that move is is a very countercultural move, and I I I. I think that it has many different forms. For some people, it means relocating our lives from places of privilege to places of struggle. For others, it means staying in places of uh, like where uh, they are economically poor, if that's where you're from. Or if you leave and you become a doctor or lawyer to go back to your neighborhood and go back to the place where uh, that struggle is happening in the world. And um, as, as uh, one of our old Catholic nuns, Sister Margaret, says, uh, the, the inner city is the contemporary desert. That's where we practice resurrection. So uh, I think it's not the only one. You know, I think that there's rural poverty. There's all kind, but, but that we are people that are moving closer towards the poverty of our neighbor and allowing it to disturb us, you know, allowing it to, to mess with us as we seek what does it mean to love our neighbor as ourselves? Because that was, I, that was pretty manageable when I lived in East Tennessee, you know, like uh, uh, loving my neighbor meant like sharing sugar with Peggy Cowan, my next door neighbor, you know, <laughs> when my neighbor neighbor was living in a cardboard box, it became a little harder to go, what does it mean to love my neighbor uh, when I'm going back to a heated room and they're, they're going to sleep on cardboard? 
So that uh, movement to the abandoned places. And then in these uh, places, we are uh, living in community. The call of the Christian is a call to community, right? Just as much as we're to be radical disciples, we are made in the image of a plurality of oneness, a God that is community that makes one human, and it's not real good until they're helping each other, right? Uh, and so that has a lot of different forms. It doesn't look t- to everybody like, uh, like it does for us, where it's, you know, uh, a dozen people living in a row house with one bathroom in North Philly. You know, I think it has many different forms and co-housing, a lot of those, but that, that a part of community is sharing a common life. So we do meals together. We live in the same geographical proximity to each other. We function kind of like a village, you know, and we, we do prayer each morning in our community. We have a Sabbath day where we rest. We have this sort of uh, rhythm to our life where we, we, we create that. And, and then we also have shared economics. And that's, that's another, that's the second mark I want to talk about where we, we, uh, see in the early church this economy where folks were sharing together and and there they met the needs of the poor among them so and uh, we in our community just like you hear many hands make for light work you know i think many wallets make for cheap rent and 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 so we're able to live very sustainably off of 150 dollars per person per month uh, because we're sharing one car, we're sharing a house, we're sharing utilities. And incidentally, uh, I think that it's going to be uh, some of the economic struggles that are coming are go- may demand community of us, you know, that we got to be more creative if we live. If, if we live in the pattern of the American dream and of Wall Street, then we're going to need five more planets, you know. So we've got to say maybe God had a different dream. And as we live in community, we see ourselves coming to life. I mean, this isn't just a sacrifice. I think it's so fun when people are like, oh, you guys are so sacrificial. I'm like, you don't know. You know, like we are alive, a part of living in community. It's what we're made for, you know. So so as we live together, we we carry the burdens of our neighborhood together with Jesus and with one another as we bear each other's burdens. And and then, like, one of the cycles that you get into is you end up uh, going to college and accumulating all this debt, and then you have to go and get a job that will pay the bills. And so you end up in this cycle where you sometimes end up uh, with, with sort of a meaningless toil that you're not necessarily called to. And I think one of the ways of, of the pattern of the world is that you got to go and accumulate more. One of the patterns of the gospel is we see how we can live off less. And so living uh, in community is a way that we can, we can do that. And and that, that shared economics is not just for ourselves, but it's for uh, the, the poor and for our neighbors. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in the church is this, uh, the, the tithes and offerings are meant to be a jubilee and a distribution to the poor. But if you look and study the contemporary uh, stewardship of the church, it's very disturbing that uh, over 95% of the church offerings are staying internal. Uh, and mostly going towards buildings and staff. But as you look at the pattern of the gospel, the offerings are put, you know, distributed to folks as they need. And there's a great theologian named Ray Mayhew that wrote a paper called Embezzlement, the Sin of the Contemporary Church. <laughs> he didn't mince words. Um, and what he shows is that we, we've really t- taken money for ourselves, and, and it sparked something in many of us to rethink the tithe. And so now we have a group called the Relational Tithe that my friends Haney and Darren, uh, right, Haney was right here in Edmonton, are a part of this group where we give 10% of our money into a common fund. And it doesn't matter if your tithe is $5 a month or $5,000 a month. We're all, we give a tithe, and then 100% of our tithe goes to meet needs in our villages and in our neighborhoods. And so we're able to, just, just as the early church said, bring up offering, uh, bring up the needs before the community. And the only um, criteria for presenting a need is that they uh, be someone that you know and you're friends with, that you can't be more than one degree of separation away. So it can't be something you read in a newsletter. It can't be an organization. It's a person. And it causes us to live in proximity with those who are struggling. So that that uh, is, is a great model. And it's all very relational. It's not some systemic, uh, you know, so like, oh, are you a communist? You know, people say, I'm like, no, like we're a community of love. And 
And that's how people feel that, is if they experience this good news in, in ways that they can touch and see. So relational tithe. There's a lot of others that I write about I'll be maybe mentioning later, too. Are, there's money collectives. Like I, I, a lot of us don't have health coverage in the U.S. Uh, 48 million people know everything's perfect in Canada, but... Um, uh, so I, I know that's not true, but we, you know, we we have collectives like I, I'm a part of uh, a, a collective right now of 20,000 uh, Christians in the U.S. that are, are committed to meeting each other's medical bills as well. So we put out a newsletter every month of who's in the hospital, and we pass the hat and cover each other's medical bills. We pray for each other by name, uh, and over the last 20 years, we've met 450 million dollars in medical bills. So, so those models, like that's the kind of thing that we need to be experimenting with and imagining in the church and like what would it look like if if you do do a building campaign you have a jubilee campaign alongside of it and you say we're going to match dollar for dollar every dollar that goes internally with this love our neighbor as ourselves to dig wells in el salvador or whatever it might be you know that, that and that is a part of our witness in the world so that's shared economics. Another is a, a mark of, of what we see happening in the church is a care for creation. And I, I, I love that uh, in, in my neighborhood, it's sort of the concrete jungle, you know, and one of the things that we get to do is help kids reconnect with the earth and with their creator. And so even just like taking over abandoned lots that are ugly and planting gardens and we get kids that, you know, one of the kids in my neighborhood, we're growing tomatoes and he's like, whoa, you can't eat that. I'm like, yeah, you can. It's a tomato. He's like, awesome you know you should have seen him when he picked a carrot you know he's like whoa it's magic you know and and uh and that that's exactly it you go yeah god made that you know uh and and it's hard to believe that that you have a, a beautiful creator when everything around you looks so ugly and, and, and so a part of way that we do that is in these neighborhoods that have been so devastated. And uh, like in Camden, New Jersey, just across the river, we have a community, 60% of the kids have asthma. 60% because of environmental racism. I mean, entire pollutant uh, sewage factory and uh, waste burning companies have been dumped on a poor African American neighborhood. And so we, we have to, uh, as Wendell Berry, you know, the farmer and theologian, he talks about practicing resurrection, that we've got to bring those spaces to life. And we've got to, so we have places like a, a greenhouse in Camden. We got a place where the kids can sit around a campfire and like they've, some of them have never done that, you know. And, and so those, those kind of things. And then we also start to look at ways that we can live that are prophetic and, and imaginative. And, and uh, so a lot of us are running our cars off of vegetable oil, you know. And it is a part of our Christian witness that my friends in, in the band, Me Without You, um, they run their bus off veggie oil. And it's, it's such a neat witness. But even MTV called them and said, hey, can we, we'd love to do a story on a veggie bus. And they're like, yeah, come on, you know. And it's a part of, like, they're able to go, yeah, uh, part of the way that we live in these peculiar ways, the reason for that is that, that we're Christian. We love the Creator. We think that we're supposed to uh, live in ways that are different from the patterns of the world. In our recovery community in Philly, there's a uh, community called New Jerusalem, and everyone's uh, recovering from drug and alcohol addictions, and they've needed jobs. So the job creation that they're doing is a greaso co-op where they take used vegetable oil from around Philly, and they make uh, biodiesel out of it, and and uh, they're they're creating jobs for folks that are formerly homeless, and they're protestifying, you know, showing us like we want to live into a post oil economy, and those sort of patterns are a part of their witness as a Christian recovery community. So that the the ch kind of jobs that we create, we're, we're mindful of. Um, next is reconciliation, and, and reconciliation is one of those uh, that. Uh, we, we lament the racial divisions in the church and pursue a just reconciliation. Dr. Martin Luther King said that it's a great tragedy that the most segregated hour in the world is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning when we go to worship. 
that so many places, you know, in the shopping malls, in the clubs, in the military, people are mixed together. And yet, when we come to worship, we tend to be some of the most homogeneous communities there are. And, and what a, 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 tra- a tragedy that, that we as a church should be people that are, are pioneering and celebrating the diversity of God's uh, uh, people. Uh, so so that, that uh, especially with the legacy of racism and, and slavery uh, in, in, in uh, the, the U.S. is a part of what we, we are doing. And I think it looks different in different places, you know, to, to, to think about our own histories as nations and things that we can do to pursue that. But it, all those big ideas like reconciliation and stuff, they don't make it into the church until they make it into our dinner tables in our living rooms. So we begin there and we say we will begin with relationships where we listen and learn from other people and from their stories. Uh, next is that we're, we, we celebrate marriage and singleness. And we see in the church a real renewal of the vocation of singleness. And uh, that's, you know, some folks would call monasticism. And uh, the beginning of monasticism is mono, that it means this single-minded mono, uh, pursuit of God and saying yes to Jesus as our lover and no to all other lovers, you know. And, and, and that, that do, doesn't necessarily mean everybody's got to be single, but in the evangelical evangelical church, I think it's something that we've kind of lost. You know, I can, it, most of the singles groups look like just places that you hook up, you know. Um, and and, and uh, Catholics and others, I think, have really celebrated singleness to the point that you feel like you can't really be Christian unless you become a nun or a priest, you know. And, and so we have to have some sort of balance and integration of those. Um, and and uh, I can remember... Um, I've, I've been mentored by a, a Catholic monk, and one of the things that he says over and over is that we can live without sex, but we can't live without love. And there are plenty of people who have a lot of sex, and they never experience love and intimacy. And there's other folks that never have sex their entire lives, and they experience love and intimacy very deeply. So we need to pursue um, whatever will allow us to seek Jesus with the most single-mindedness. And if that be single, beautiful. If that be married, beautiful, you know. But we can't lose that. And I, I, I remember one pastor that I was in his congregation, he did the children's sermon, and he had a husband and wife and two kids in this p- portrait that he showed the kids. And then he prayed for all the kids to find the one that God had for them. <laughs> That's terrible theology. Uh, you know, I mean, this is absurd. We have a, a beautiful li- a history of, of, of folks that have lived lives of singleness, and that's allowed them to live the recklessness of the gospel. And, I mean, start with the apostles. You know, like, our, like Mother Teresa, you don't go, oh, if she'd only met her husband, you know. Poor thing. So, so, so let's let's uh, invite ourselves and our young people to uh, to to be open to seeing that that God may uh, have one or the, or the other, but there's not one prescription for that. Next is that we are communities that are committed to hospitality. So hospitality is a mark that we have open homes to the stranger, that we welcome folks that are homeless or in crisis into our homes and into our communities. Dorothy Day said, if simply every Christian home had room for the the homeless and for the, the alien and the stranger, we would end poverty. So we're not just seeing ourselves as places of social work and where we see folks as clients and consumers, but really where we see ourselves as a community of grace and hospitality, and we welcome folks uh, into our homes. And that doesn't necessarily look the same again for everybody. I mean, for, for uh, my, my buddy Darren and his family here that are with me, they, they met a, a woman that was 80 years old, and she has Alzheimer's, and she was losing her home and didn't have much family, and they said, well, come live with us, you know, and they basically adopted her, and now Gwen and Justice, their son, and the, the, Darren and Megan live together, and they, you know, travel, and they're this beautiful, quirky family. This is our son. This is our adopted granny, you know, <laughs> but they're, they're a family, and they, they've created a place for someone in a way that I think Jesus will say, oh, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me in, in Matthew 25. So, hospitality. Uh, next is that we're communities that are committed to prayer, 
and to uh, uh, seeking Jesus together. So again, in our community, we do prayer every morning. We do uh, time, times where we go on retreats and ways that we, we uh, right now, one of the exciting things is that we're creating a prayer book where we can all be reading scriptures together and celebrating different saints and heroes and sheroes of the church, you know. Uh, so learning to pray together. But also, I think a lot of times we... Um, we use prayer as an excuse for inaction, you know, where <laughs> we go, God, why don't you do something? And I think God's saying back, I did do something. I made you, you know, get out there. <laughs> so, so sometimes when we hear, you know, uh, someone present a prayer request of like, well, I, I need a wheelchair ramp for my, my home. Then we, we don't simply say we're going to pray for you. Uh, but we, we say that. And we also say, and we're going to get some carpenters together. and We're going to build a wheelchair ramp. You know, <laughs> But a lot of times the church, when, you, when someone shares something and you hear someone say, great, I'll be praying for you, you, you knew that they weren't about to do anything else, you know. So, so we, we pray and we act, and those have to, to go together. Uh, next is that we're communities committed to peacemaking, and the, and, a, and the church is a church made of peacemakers. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And that, that, that starts with each of us, I think, learning to, to see the log in our own eye. And, and as Scripture says, not go to the altar if we've got something against a brother or sister, that we uh, confess. And confession is a, a radical countercultural practice. You know, just to say, I'm sorry. Uh, and counter-imperial, too, I think. You never see a, a president or prime minister that confesses unless they're, like, caught on tape, you know. So, so yeah, but, but, like, we're people that say we're sorry. And, and the church is a place where you can say you're sorry and you know that you'll be embraced with grace. Uh, so, so that, that, and then that causes us, too, to ask questions in, in our neighborhoods and in the, in the brokenness of our streets. You know, here, kids are shooting each other. You know, we, we've had nearly a homicide every day in Philadelphia. So what does it mean to be peacemakers and, and to teach uh, kids the way of, of the cross, of saying, uh, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, and that it's more courageous to, to love your enemy than to, to, to try to destroy them. And, uh, and that also means that we think of the world that we live in. And, and again, Dr. King said, I've told the kids in the ghettos that violence won't solve their problems, but then they ask me, why does our government use massive doses of violence to try to bring the change that it wants in the world? And I knew that I could no longer speak against the violence of the ghettos without also speaking against the violence of my government. Of course, he got killed shortly after that, you know, but, but it's that sort of message of reconciliation that has also taken uh, many Christians uh, to areas of conflict right now where there are Christian peacemaker teams in Iraq. There's Christian peacemaker teams in Gaza. There's folks that are doing the work of reconciliation and trying to breathe grace into these areas of conflict and to interrupt injustice with grace everywhere it, it rises uh, to, to be people who have a consistent ethic of life from the womb to the tomb, you know? And, and for me, that means as Christians, we got to be thinking deeply about things like abortion, but we also have to be thinking about things like the death penalty and poverty and war, and all of those are issues of, of, of life. So, uh, peacemakers. Uh, finally, uh, that as a church, uh, as, as a movement in the church, uh, I, we're, we're submitted to each other and to the larger story of, of what God is doing uh, as a church. So we don't see our ourselves pulling out of the church and being this sort of renegade movement at, at odds with the church. Um, and some of this is what I would critique within other uh, sectors where you, you have folks that are going, well, we're going to just do our own thing and, and we don't need the rest of the church. But the early Christians said, uh, the person who does not have the church as her mother uh, cannot have God as their father. That, 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 that this has to go together. That this is God's instrument. And it's a mess. You know, Augustine said the church is a mother. Uh, the church is a whore, but she's my mother. You know, she's a whore, but she's my mother. And we love her. And as a dysfunctional parent, we, uh, we also try to call her to all that she can be. And we, we, we try to uh, not allow her dysfunction to destroy our brothers and sisters, you know. But we, we love the church. Uh, and the church needs discontent. Amen? 
Uh, that's what Catholics understand so well. Like most of the big dissenters become saints, you know, (laughs) like the the church needs uh, discontent. So if you've been wounded or hurt, like you you may have the spiritual gift of frustration, you know, like there's plenty of people in in the church that don't see anything wrong. And and so they're very limited in what they can actually do to try to, 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 to call the church to who she's meant to be. Uh, So that's a gift, you know, the, um, and, and, and so we, we don't need to be pretentious and to think that we're going to go and do the church better than anyone's ever done it. Uh, in our neighborhood, we all go to our local congregations. We, we just, we go right into the, we're very parish minded. So we go to Catholic mass or we go to the Mennonite congregation, or we go to the Pentecostal congregation, whatever like uh, seems to resonate with, with us, we, we go, but we always go locally. We don't Church, we're not church planters, and and uh, um, and one of our neighborhood pastors said something so well. He goes, he goes, yeah, of course the church is a mess. It's made up of people, and and, and he said, it, I, I like to think of it sort of like Noah's Ark, you know, Noah's Ark. He said, it stinks inside, it stinks, but if you get out, you'll drown. You're, you're drowned. So, so that's a good way of thinking of the church, maybe, is that she does stink inside, but if we get out, we'll drown. It must be a part of celebrating uh, this, this story from which we come. Let's pray together, shall we? Thank you, God, for this conversation for every person in this room. Thank you for desiring to use us to be instruments of your kingdom and we pray that it would come on earth as it is in heaven thank you for not wanting to change the world without us give us creativity that we might not conform to the patterns of this world but that we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind by a fresh imagination with how we live in the world Form us into the beautiful body that you want us to be. May we be your hands and your feet in the world that people would come to know of your love. Not that they would see the good things that we do, but that they would be able to taste how good is our God. How good is our God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, May you become fully alive in the love of God.